have the exact date of my uh, when we met uh, in that I have an autographed copy of Masters of Atlantis, which had just come out in the fall of 1985. Um, I had been teaching high school in Dallas and not liking that at all. So I had moved back to Little Rock. Um, where I was staying with my parents for a while uh, and was getting ready to move to New York or preparing to move to New York to make a career as a writer, I hoped. Um, so I um, had recently read The Dog of the South. I found it in a bookstore, used bookstore in Dallas. Um, I knew the Portis name, of course, from True Grit. I hadn't at that time read True Grit because I thought it was a Western and I'm not really interested in Westerns. Um, but I found a copy of The Dog of the South. Um, I bought it and read it in Dallas and it was just the funniest book I'd, I'd ever read. Uh, and perhaps more important to me at the time, the hero, if you can call him that, Ray Midge, is from Little Rock. And he was the that was the only novel I'd read where the the main character was from Little Rock, so that was of interest to me as well. So when I I got to Little Rock, and uh, uh, Masters of Atlantis had just come out, I went and got a copy at Wordsworth Books, and um, I wrote a note to Mr. Portis because um, he lived in the same apartment complex as my parents. Um, and I explained that I was uh, wanting to be a writer and was getting ready to move to New York. And I had bought a copy of his novel and wondered if he would sign it for me. So he um, unexpectedly invited me to lunch at uh, the Town Pump, which is gratefully still there. And um, I brought my copy for him to sign. That was October 22nd, 1985. And um, we had a casual lunch, um, didn't talk much about uh, writing, really. We talked a lot about our backgrounds. My parents were from, my mother was from South Arkansas, and his, that's where he grew up, um, which is something all Arkansans end up doing when they get together. Um, I do remember the bartender saying, you know, hey, Charlie, you're going to put me in your next book? And him saying, you don't want to be in this one. Uh, and that was, uh, that would have been Gringo's would, would have been the book he was working on at the time, which has a, some, so a lot of unsavory characters in it. So we, um, had a great lunch, uh, met a, met up a couple of other times before I ended up moving to New York. Uh, he was very, you know, very generous with his, his time and, uh, once I got to New York, uh, we, um, you know, had a correspondence, uh, occasional correspondence. And, and when I came back to Little Rock to visit my parents, we'd always get together for uh, lunch or a beer. Um, and uh, the, that's that's how the relationship, uh, um, you know, moved, moved forward. Over, over the years, uh, we did exchange some letters about the writing life uh, and he was uh, you know very generous with his practical advice um, about things like deadlines and uh, you know not not worrying too much about uh, about things as you're writing uh, just you know little notes of encouragement along the way that that kept me kept me going uh, uh, then in, in 2007, I moved uh, back to Little Rock to uh, work on a book of my own about uh, uh, called uh, ended up being called Carry the Rock about Central High uh, and its football team 50 years after the uh, integration crisis of 1957, um, and since. I was uh, working on the, uh, you know, uh, pretty much working by myself in my office on, on that book um, and, and had, you know, a free time. We would, I joined the group that gathered at Faded Rose uh, 
at around four o'clock on Monday, usually. And uh, that was a pretty regular, uh, regular stop. Um, and, uh, you know, Mr. Portis was there among uh, uh, another group of, uh, of Arkansas characters. Um, and uh, that was, you know, just an enjoyable, casual time to share a beer and uh, swap stories and, um, you know, get to get to know each other. So that was that was really when the relationship, you know, w when we got closer during during those regular um, regular day drinking sessions. <laughs> <laughs> the bar, we didn't never never deigned to take a table. Um, but he he was uh, really blended in with the rest of the, you know, participants at the of, of bar talk uh, of which his work shows you he's a, a, a great aficionado. He's probably one of the greatest bar writers that we have. Um, but he he displayed uh, he, he was certainly not the most demonstrative voice at the bar, but he, he uh, as is true of a lot of his characters, he had a very wry and deadpan sense of humor that uh, if you weren't listening closely, uh, could go right past you. Uh, but uh, I inevitably, inevitably found myself, you know, going home and writing down uh, some of the things he said just to, so that I would remember, um, remember them uh but he was, uh, he was one, you know, he wasn't treated any differently from anybody else at the bar. Um, and uh, he was by no means the center, center of attention. Uh, uh, but it was, you know, great to remember those, uh, uh, those times in, when he would, you know, throw a, a witty comment out uh, that, uh, it, it was appreciated by the by the gathered crew there. In his later years, when he left journalism, he made a lot of fun of journalists, but he was uh, quite an accomplished journalist himself and took the the job very seriously. Um, he, you know, spent a year at the Commercial Appeal in Memphis, then um, joined. Uh, the Arkansas Gazette. Um, his uh, when he took over the Our Town column, I think that was a little bit out. You'd think it would be in his, uh, you know, wheelhouse, but he said he always felt a little uncomfortable as a columnist. He was, um, and I think that uh, that showed when he left uh, Arkansas and went to New York to work for the International Herald Tribune, uh, where they put him on, you know. Uh, several beats, um, uh, especially uh, the civil rights uh, beat in 1963. Um, and there was a group of, uh, you know, writers from the South uh, who were, um, who New York editors anyway felt would be more equipped to cover the upheaval in the South than um, than some of the New York New Yorkers or or reporters from elsewhere, so he joined a co cohort like uh, Tom Wolfe, who was from Virginia, and Marshall Frady, who who ended up being, uh, you know, some of the finest uh, reporters um, on that beat, um, and he was uh, he was admired in that group. Uh, uh, he always told me that uh, he was put on on that beat because he was, uh, you know, on a paper at the International Herald Tribune with, with uh, Jimmy Breslin and others. They had New York pretty well covered, but um, he was uh, a Southerner and they, they felt he could, you know, speak to the people uh, of the South. Um, and during that summer of 1963, he did some great reporting on uh, the murder of Medgar, Ed, Edgar, Medgar Evers in Mississippi, uh, all night riots in Birmingham, the jailing of uh, Martin Luther King in uh, Albany, Georgia. Uh, 
Um, and those pieces uh, stand up to scrutiny today as, as some of the finest on the ground reporting that was done during, during that time. His voice is really a singular one in uh, American literature in that uh, the five novels that he produced are so different from each other, and yet they all mine this American grain of uh, boundless optimism, of uh, naivete, uh, and, and uh, you know, con men, uh, Rye observers of uh, of American culture and life, um, violence is part of uh, his work in a way that seems particularly uh, American, especially in a, a work like Gringos uh, and and also True Grit, um, and so he seems. Uh, there was somebody, I don't remember, unfortunately, who uh, tweeted it, but uh, I do remember a tweet that somebody wrote about his work saying that they felt like he had nailed the great American novel three or four times. And uh, so his subjects, uh, even though they're, they seem sometimes arcane, as in Masters of Atlantis or uh, genre specific as in True Grit, they really capture uh, a broad spectrum of the American spirit uh, in a way that few, few other novelists are able to do. Um, you know, uh, I think, you know, Philip Roth did the same thing with his series of novels late in, in his career um, in you know, uh, but he's compared to Twain a lot. But I think in, in a lot of ways, Twain, um, you know, deals with this narrow, uh, a narrow stretch of, you know, American experience um, in a way that probably is particular to his time. Uh, whereas Portis was dealing with sort of uh, centuries of American life and seeming to capture something about the American character in each of his books that's, uh, you know, that no other writer has, has been able to, to touch, it seems to me. Um, and of course, humor, that's, that's a through line in all his works. As I was, uh, you know, getting to know Mr. Portis better at the bar, and uh, after I'd finished my own book, um, I was looking for a, my next project. And um, I had, through the years, accumulated a collection that I'd of his work that I'd torn from magazines like The Atlantic and uh, the Arkansas Times and um, other other places where I'd I'd uh, found occasional pieces that he had done, um, and they were I used to reread them a lot, and I thought I would just wish these were had been collected in a book, um, and uh, the the more I began to you know research pieces that he'd written uh, on assignment or uh, the journalism, uh, I began to see that there was quite a substantial amount of work that had uh, had been neglected or um, all but forgotten. And uh, that in rereading it, that it, you know, it could stand rereading. It's uh, a lot of the um, assignment work that even the best writers do is sort of forgettable and um, written for a paycheck and 
uh, and then uh, not worthy of reprinting. But I was really surprised by the volume that he, he'd of work that he'd done as a freelance writer and as a staff writer on <clears throat> newspapers that deserved to be preserved. Uh, so I began a more systematic uh, excavation of the work. Um, I found uh, that I hadn't been aware of before a, a long story that he'd done for the Los Angeles Times Sunday Magazine back in the 60s after Norwood, but before True Grit that described a long trip down the Baja California Peninsula that clearly prefigures a lot of what shows up in the Dog of the South. And uh, so there were discoveries uh, along the way too, um, as well as the play that he'd written and collaborated with the late uh, Cliff Baker at the Arkansas Rep uh, that had gotten a two week run um, in the at, at the theater and uh, had been then put away in a drawer. So um, once I'd sort of amassed these this collection, um, I was speaking about my you know file that I had at the Arkansas Literary Festival, and Rod Lorenzen was in the audience to hear the panel that we'd convened about Portis. Uh, including Kane Webb and Graham Gordy, who had had been in the play at the the rep, and uh, Rod approached me after the uh, after the panel and said, "If if I can get Buddy Portis to agree to do the book uh, for the Butler Center, would you edit it?" And I said, Man, "Nothing would make me happier." So um, I'd mentioned it to. Mr. Portis before uh, that I had this folder and I thought about collecting them and he kind of, you know, waved up, waved me off. And so I guess Rod was more convincing uh, than, than I was. And also I think that the fact that it was a project for the library was important to, to Charlie that, uh, you know, that he uh, was always a big fan of the, of, of libraries and of this library in particular. Um, and I think that meant, that meant something to him. His only, um, you know, caveat for me, uh, as the editor was he trust, he trusted my judgment, but, um, he was just concerned that the works that I did choose, you know, hold up and still that they still read well, um, some of them 50 years later. Um, and I assured him that I would, you know, apply that standard to the work. And uh, in fact, there were some Our Town columns that seemed, um, you know, seemed promising in in subject matter that, uh, you know, probably that didn't really hold up over, over time. But most of the major stories that he did for the Saturday Evening Post for that uh, the Arkansas Times trip down the Washita River. Um, they're all, you know, magnificent in in his way, and uh, really not just reward reading, but reward rereading uh, as much of his work does. I haven't, you know, gotten. It probably hasn't hit me yet that uh, that he's gone. And um, I don't think that uh, since Jonathan Portis, his brother, has mentioned it himself uh, uh, in uh, the obituaries that he was suffering from Alzheimer's. And uh, that it's tragic for anyone to go as long as he did uh, in the grip of that disease. Um, so we've been uh the the family in particular and and his friends as well have been dealing with the the gradual loss uh of him over the last uh, 8 years um you know i still loved going to visit him and you uh you know you'd, you'd still see evidence of that humor and uh 
and always the um, generosity and uh, you know that uh, wry smile that uh, that was was still there. Um, so it's it's hard to lose him physically. Uh, and uh, it's it's still difficult to to think about, um, but the the gradual loss through Alzheimer's was really uh, really you know painfully spread over a, a long period of time. Um, but yeah, we'll um, I'll, I'll miss him uh, miss him a lot.